Hello, everybody. I'm Susan Crawford from Harvard Law School. We like to call ourselves Harvard Leadership School. And uh, like Steve Coonan, I'm totally focused on cities. They are very chic these days, and they are the places to study. I am hoping that some of you have the question ringing in your mind that I heard Manfred ask Munter, which is, is this good for democracy? Is this good for people? And because humans are by nature cheerful and resilient, I've started something new across Harvard University to examine those kinds of questions and to uh, ensure that we're helping to build the capacity of local governments to answer all the questions that Rob just raised, that laundry list. And I deliberately picked responsive and not smart. Because smart connotes that there's some agency in the cloud that is omnipotent, all wise, making decisions with no human intervention. That's not actually what's going on or should be going on in cities. The role of policy, of leadership, of engagement from inside the city is crucial. So I want more students, frankly, to change the generational picture inside local and federal government and make sure that they can cope with this new era. So here's our problem, especially in America. We just don't trust government. Look at that last bit. Most Americans think that they would do a better job solving problems than the government, right? This is the challenge. Because look at this second slide. Although we don't trust them, we actually rely on government to provide a safety net, take care of the elderly, educate everyone, ensure that we have an adequate level of health care. We believe that that's their role. We're looking for help. And when it doesn't happen, when we have impoverished government services that no one trusts, we end up with Charlotte last night. We end up with terrible social conditions throughout the country if we can't trust and rely on government and support it. So our expectations of government are enormously high right now because we all expect that things are going to arrive immediately, government risks becoming an anachronism. And then what, what do we do? We end up with a society in which if you can pay for safety, you get it. If you can pay for health care, you get it. But we leave behind most Americans. There is no public anymore. Just ask the New York Times. They can't rely on anybody reading their newspaper. Everybody's fractured. We're going in a 1,000 directions. But we still have many public needs. And we have public values that are at stake. So responsive communities with very small font that you can't read, showing that you know, we're not that great at branding so far. Um, what we're doing is uh, training students to work very closely with local government in a lab setting most of the time, solving problems together to address a lot of the privacy issues, but also the enormous infrastructure issues that underlie everything we're talking about today. Because here, look at this. Without fiber optic everywhere going deep into neighborhoods and cities, everything we've been talking about for these last two days is built on sand. Now, there's this wonderful moment where Aretha Franklin at the Kennedy Center Honors last year flings off her fur coat. And you, you watch what she does. You'll cry watching how beautiful it is. But because we're all basically nerds, and this is MIT, I'm actually going to put something on at this point. This is, um, this is the jacket that we developed for the Responsive Communities Initiative. It's called Team Fiber. Team Fiber, right? Across the university, I'm trying to help students and work with mayors to ensure that they're taking control of their digital destinies, that there is open fiber optic going deep into neighborhoods and very close to houses, and that the interfaces to the street lamps that Steve wants access to are open and modular, just the way that Deborah Estrin describes the internet. Cities have to be in control of their digital destiny, or they won't be able to make the rest of this happen. Ensure that they're collecting data that can then be open ensure that there are sensible algorithms that are not overly discriminatory. We have a deep need to make this the new internet. Fiber everywhere, sensors that the city understands and can have the capacity to cope with, and data that is visualized so that the city becomes a civic mesh, very visible to its occupants, not just this impoverished you vote, you pay taxes once, I deliver services to a subset of citizens. 
that is not a sustainable approach to the life of American cities. So here's what we're doing. We're looking at fiber, addressing the barriers to uh, making sure that fiber is deep into cities and open and wholesale and available so that communications capacity is ubiquitous. Uh, just go visit Tokyo or South Korea, then come back to the United States. You feel like you're visiting a third world nation, frankly. Um, we're very interested in leadership, in ensuring that the wonderful students that are at Harvard, and we, I'd love to work with the MIT folks as well, think of local government as a career, or at least part of their career plans, so that they uh, understand that these jobs can be actually quite exciting, that there are opportunities for change. I've never seen a more sincere and earnest generation than the students I have in my classrooms every day. They really want to serve. They want to be called to assist others. They are a very collaborative generation. And I think it's the university's obligation to give all of them opportunities to see themselves as agents of their careers and of their opportunities for serving in the particularly local setting where you can see the impact of what you're up to every day in cities. So leadership is a tremendous part of the Responsive Communities Initiative. Um, Mr. Bloomberg just gave a gazillion dollars to the Kennedy School and the, Law, and the Business School to train mayors to uh, be more responsive, better actors in this 21st century setting. There is a huge role for students to be part of that training, de developing the curriculum to themselves uh, be leaders in this new, new world. So collaboration among faculty, staff, and students and engagement with as many policymakers as we can drag in. Look, it's helpful that the university is not a corporation. There's a difference. Our role is to open our walls and allow the beautiful buildings we have to be used as platforms for collaboration. I strongly believe this. I personally have no consulting clients. I'm staying way far away from that because I think that's inappropriate in a university. We're really here to bring others together and talk about the public values that are important and then solve problems together. Third, uh, we're doing a lot of work on data stewardship, data governance. Starting with open data, I've pulled together city data officers from across the country to talk about the privacy issues inherent in open data, have them meet with data scientists, very difficult for a city person to do without a university in the middle, and make sure that we're at least aware of the risks of de-identification. We all know it's impossible to completely de-identify data, but come up with techniques to provide that onion skin layer of NDAs or whatever uh, other controls are necessary to allow the most data to be revealed with the least risk to both the city and the citizens involved. So fiber comes first, it's the essential infrastructure, otherwise the whole thing won't work. Uh, making sure that interfaces to streetlights are open. By the way, poles, I just want to bring you into my nerdy world, uh, utility poles are operatic. They're like uh, battlefields. Steve's right, very difficult to get access to them. Streetlights are part of a city's right of way and should be made available for all the wireless carriers and others to hook up to with power at a set rate so that the Internet of Things takes off. This is essential for the entire thing to work. We're doing as much as we can to get uh, students into leadership roles inside city government and to advise governments on um, data stewardship. So the plan is, here's what we're up to, a cross-university lab involving undergrads as well. At Harvard, I think they're the coolest of all the student groups in working on projects for which they get credit that harness their enormous energies in the service of solving some of these enormous problems with citizens and cities and uh, applying them. This is a very applied approach. Um, training and empowering students to take on leadership roles, looking for connections with cities that want to hire them. And here's the big deal for me, an emphasis on cities controlling their own destinies. There's a tsunami of vendors coming towards them. This is the whole smart cities movement. And cities have to be able to look them in the eye and say, no, we don't necessarily want that, or we want it only on our terms, terms that are good for the public, terms that serve public values. 
digital justice. There's a lot to worry about in the use of algorithms, but I'm optimistic. I'm sure that we can work together to come up with social justice minded uses of big data. And finally, stewardship. Stewardship of data. The city is really a fiduciary. It has obligations to all of us, and with that role in mind, can act effectively. So I'm here to introduce you to all of the, the beauties of the Responsive Communities Initiative. I look forward to collaborating. I love talking to Rob. I really enjoyed uh, the presentation about um, uh, transportation. There are enormous opportunities for collaboration, and we are wide open to it. Thank you all very much. Thank you.